come on stage, Mark Meadows from Botanic and Sea Token. Please give him a warm welcome. Okay. Iskren, Eva, Imo, Blagadaria. It's great to be here. And um, it's also, for me, this is something where um, there's going to be some strange topics that I'll be discussing. Um, one of the key things I decided to do was actually start a little bit with my background. This is uncommon for me, but it was in 1992 that I moved out to San Francisco and I helped to develop what was the third dot-com website. And um, we were there figuring out, do we put a back button on these things? It was well.com, we developed the thing, we began building personal pages for people. I started a virtual reality company in 95, sold it in 98, and then went on to work at Stanford Research Institute and Xerox Park. Got involved in, seems like the speaker is very loud. <laughs> Can we turn the volume down a little bit, please? Um, got involved in artificial intelligence and natural language processing, in particular computer vision. And as an aging Dungeons and Dragons geek, I, of course, with this background in VR, said, how do we make conversational characters? And what is the future of interface? And started an AI company, uh, it was in 2005, and we were trying to build something like Alexa, in which it was able to answer any question at any time for anyone, but that wasn't actually valuable for anybody. We were using probabilistic inference to generate sets of data that you could talk with. So we had 200 Arnold Schwarzenegger interviews, for example, and we took them all through, and we looked at, like, what are the phrases he's most commonly using? And we asked the system, what do you think of gay marriage? And the Arnold bot said, gay marriage should be between a man and a woman, and if you ask me again, I'll make you do 500 push-ups. <laughs> And that was a really important moment for me. Of course, we got a lot of crap out of the system as well. Um, and this was still in San Francisco. But what I recognized at that point was that artificial intelligence, this cluster of technologies, whether it's natural language processing or automated speech recognition or prediction models that we're using for supply chain, all have to have an interface. And in order for us to actually interface with these massive sets of data, we have to look at ways that are really simple and ways in which we can combine technologies so that they're simple and fun and useful. So I'm gonna talk about a few things. So the, the reason I mention my background is because I, I've been in the Bay Area for all these years, and as I watch things like Cambridge Analytica occur, and as I see really questionable behavior coming from where I grew up, professionally, I began to wonder, are there other solutions? I'll be talking about bots and conversational user interfaces, how they're surveillant, some of the basics of how they're built, how you can build them, how distributed ledgers are now solving problems that artificial intelligence is introducing into our world, and ways in which we can build these models together. Um, Alexa, Google Home Assistant, Alexa right now is massive and it's moving forward very quickly. These are essentially bots. They're chat bots and they have an automated speech recognition layer that's built on top of them. And so when you talk with Alexa, there are these various API calls that are going on in the back. So you say, what is the weather? And that audio, what is the weather, gets translated into the text. And then there's an intent that's recognized in that text that go and then goes off to a particular API service, such as the weather. And then there's a response that comes back and then it says from generating the natural language, the weather's partly cloudy, and then that gets translated into the audio. So there's these five API calls whenever you talk with Alexa. And this is a very advanced system, and, and there are, in many ways, there's like, you know, the skills and over 30,000 discrete functions that Alexa has. And they're giving away Alexas for free. People are, are basically using them all the time. Actually, I'm gonna go back really quick. And, and if somebody gives you something for free, like a multi-million dollar AI system in your home, you should ask what their motivations are. If someone were to come up on the street and offer me drugs for free, I would probably want to know, well, what's in them? And what are the side effects? What are the benefits? Who is the person that's offering this to me? And what's their motivation, right? 
So we'll come back to this in just a second. Bots, though, are multimodal. And we're looking at third generation bots now that are not only chat bots that are using words and assistants that are using voice, but we also can drive both the computer vision input of the end user as well as the animation output of the avatar visually. And that's how we as human beings speak and function and have over the last 50,000 years. Botanic has personality templates and character design tools and use flow wizards, publishing tools, API aggregation systems, and over a dozen patents in this space, including voice to blockchain bridge and methods for natural language processing. So we started the company in 2011 and we've been, kind of, it's been a rough time at moments where we've really, in 2011 when we started, we noticed Bitcoin coming out, and then we were involved in the Ethereum ICO, and then we ran out of money at one point, and Ethereum was at $20 per token, and I'm like, oh, I can pay staff with Ethereum. <laughs> so we managed to keep ourselves alive going through these developments of our products. We can deploy our major operating systems, and just as you are able to use many different channels to communicate with, communicate with your friends, bots are able to do the same thing. So, by the way, just technically speaking, because I very much respect the audience that's here, there's a, a rough overview that we have. There are language engines. We have a lot of the natural language processing that's there. We're using third-party libraries extensively because we, yeah, get your cameras out and take the picture here. Because we don't want to actually become a company that goes out and has to train voice rack libraries. What we do is we provide a switching station so that all of those existing libraries can be combined into the simplest possible interface. And then we del with, there's the presentation layer, which may include the avatar or may not, and then we have all the different delivery channels that we work across. So bots are made first and foremost for listening. And the reason why there is so much interest around them, and I'm not talking about the Mirai-style scripted bots for DDoS attacks. I'm talking about conversational interfaces like Alexa. And Alexa's listening all the time. I talked to the guys at Intel that made the Sioux Creek processor, and I said, so Alexa tells us that it's only recording the wake word locally, and then it begins working with the cloud. And those guys said, no, no, that's not actually the case. It's always recording. It's always on. All that Amazon can configure is the amount of time with which that audio signal is being processed. So even if you turn Alexa off, it's still listening. Why did Amazon give us this multi-million dollar AI system in our homes? Who's got an Alexa, by the way? Yay, all right. I'm glad to be talking with the right audience. <laughs> so, um, so back to, back to Arnold. When this bot said this surprising, or I'll make you do 500 push-ups phrase, we realized that the user experience of artificial intelligence is personality. That company blew a flat. And when we started Botanic, we said, let's, let's redesign this from the user perspective. Let's build contextual systems that are there only for a particular function. And that requires a whole lot of design. These are images of some of our builds. This is Jackie on the left, and you can see that we have these. This is open source. This is all via WebGL. You can drive it via browsers like Mozilla's uh, Netscape or Safari, whatever. Um, we also have developed apps. And in many cases, we've been working in the wellness vertical, mobility, finance, entertainment, so these are what the characters look like, and we do this because we don't want the character to be mistaken for a human. When you're talking with this AI system, it needs to look like something that's not human. Microsoft is our biggest customer, and this is Andy. We did four builds with them on Skype platform uh, using the Skype bot framework in part. And Andy was there as a career assistant and a job coach. She would help you get ready for an interview and say, oh, you know, try to relax a little bit or change the lighting, and was there to really offer sort of soft skills coaching. 
And this was an interesting project because what we were able to do was to combine all of Microsoft cognitive services on the back end and run all of those cables into the back of this avatar's head so that it wasn't just recognizing the voice, wasn't just also working as a chat bot, wasn't just recognizing the face, but was also able to measure the emotions of the end user that it was speaking with. And that's really cool because in the case of healthcare, where we build a highly surveillance system, we need to know exactly the emotions that are driving a person's decision, whether it's not taking the drugs that they should be taking, or whether it's going outside when the air quality index is too low. Now, people have said, what, what are you doing putting faces on artificial intelligence? And, and there's two main reasons. One, this gives us an excuse to have the end user's face kind of in front of the screen so we can actually measure how they feel. Um, now, by the way, in, in voice, there's over 200 data sets that are there. Such, you know, for example, you can tell just from my voice that I'm basically middle American accent, that I'm a middle-aged male. Those three are only three of 200 different vectors that the voice alone is able to collect. And when you cross-intersect that and begin to build correlational data sets with what a the visual appearance of the user, you can really understand a lot about their core motivations. That's what Amazon wants. As an Alexa skills developer, you might have noticed that you don't get affect data back, you don't get the first recording back, but you do get the API calls that were made. Amazon wants to know how we feel. Now, the reason also why we're building faces isn't just so that we can build highly surveillant systems, that include the face, but it's also because the human limbic system, this piece of hardware we all carry between our ears, hasn't really been upgraded in 50,000 years. So we're used to seeing words and sounds and images together. The reason I'm standing on this stage is because this is how we think and this is how we as humans have evolved. Back in Mesopotamia, the shepherd would say, hey there, farmer, and the farmer would say, hey, shepherd, and they would do that thing so that they could communicate and trust each other. Nowadays, we break this down so that the words are natural language understanding for the input, and then the system responds with natural gener generation on the output. The sounds, ASR and TTS, and then we're using C computer vision and ACTR for driving the character itself. And this driving the character thing is kind of tricky, too, because you have to be able to animate the character without knowing in advance what it's going to be saying. I'll leave that for another talk. All right. So bots are aggregating lots and lots of data. They're really collecting, again, not just how we speak and see and move and which API services we're asking for when, but we're also now with bots being able to collect the emotions and the core motivational drivers behind them. It's highly, highly surveillant stuff. Okay, so working in some of the research centers in the Bay Area, and having worked with three government agencies, uh, China, Han, and the US, I began to really wonder over the years, what's gonna be happening now? What responsibility does Botanic have in developing these systems with customers, the Fortune 100 customers and startups and government agencies, as bots are gonna be growing? 2021, we're looking at a seven times uptick in bots. We're all gonna be talking with software soon. 2020, 30% of the web is going to be used without a screen, according to Gartner. And by 2022, bots will be responsible for 8 billion annums in savings. That savings line is weird. Because companies come to us and they say, hey, we have all these people that are working at the CRM system and they're using all their time to like, talk with customers and we really want to replace them with bots. And so we're like, Wait, do you want to replace them or do you want to make them more effective? The three main problems that artificial intelligence, again, this cluster of technologies presents, is a loss of jobs, there's going to be a loss of privacy and trust, and most importantly, a loss of control and an imbalance of power. First off, and again, I apologize for the stat that's so American-focused. It happened to be what was handy, but I think it's true for most industrial countries. And these numbers are even more extreme in China with systems like Baidu, Tencent, and Alibaba. But 43% of Americans are going to be 
well, they're, they're afraid of losing their job, and that's probably because 47% 47 actually will have their job changed by AI. Now, the computer and the calculator, once upon a time, were desk jobs, and those are people that would write with a pen and paper, and they would compute. And then the computer came along, and then those folks ended up becoming calculators. And then the calculator came along, and those people became us, engineers and programmers. We're going to see that same displacement occur, and as we move into this fourth industrial revolution, we will see that there will be changes that we can project from the previous industrial revolutions as well. In the first industrial revolution, people ended up, instead of driving the plow, being driven by the plow. And they began to go inside, and the seasons became obsolete. Now, I'm being driven constantly by the system in my pocket, and my days and nights are obsolete. So we're looking at changes in how our work is going to be structured. There's also an imbalance of power, and in the healthcare use case with some of the healthcare bots we've built, it was really surprising. There were three different research projects that got the same basic data set that showed that if there was somebody who was having some kind of a chronic illness problem, they would talk with this bot, and they were more willing to tell the bot what the problem was than they were their doctor or nurse. Now, in a way, that makes sense, because if I've got something, you know, let's say I'm HIV positive, and I am embarrassed to tell my doctor about that, but I'm willing to tell a bot. I just, I don't want to be judged, and so I'll tell that system. So they're more open with the information that they give to bots. But then where it gets weird is that then the bot also, when it gives advice, almost 80%, something around there, are more likely to do what the bot tells them than an actual person. And the reason for that is because they believe it's objectively true, because it's artificial intelligence. These myths and these ideas around how we interface with these systems that we're building present an imbalance of power. So suddenly, that bot has a lot more information about the patient, and it also has a lot more control over them. These imbalances of power also are showing up in terms of how media is being used. The French, American, and UK elections have all been at least affected by bots and conversational systems. And then we get to my favorite subject, which is Facebook. <laughs> and we also see that whether it is targeted advertising, textual analysis, or facial analysis, that the amount of data that Facebook now has on us is immense. And in the 2015 study, please take a look at this. It's interesting research that they published. They had, I think it was about a million users, and they were doing affect detection on what those users were posting. And then what they would do is they would show those users some kind of an image. And they found that the users that were posting things that were sad, when they were given a happy image, would begin to post happy things. And then those users that were sad, when they were shown a sad image, would then also begin to type sadder things as well. But what that means is that Facebook knows how you're feeling and knows how to change the way you feel. That's only from web page interfaces. That's not really using voice inflection and the kinds of affect detection that we can get from things like Alexa and multimodal bots. But wait, it gets weirder. <laughs> Who's heard of Pokemon Go? Okay. So Pokemon Go, I, I, th I think that there were some hands that didn't go up here. Pokemon Go was essentially a famous game in which people were going out in the world and they were looking for Pokemon as augmented reality characters. There were various spots around a number of cities. And I'm like, oh, they're like avatars, they're augmented reality avatars. That's like the kind of thing we make. Do these Pokemon talk? And so I download the app, and I'm like looking at it, and it says it wants OAuth level permissions on my phone. And I'm thinking, why does it need to send email as Mark Stephen Meadows so that I can go hunt Pokemon? So I track it back upstream. And it turns out that Pokemon Go is published by a company named Niantic. And Niantic, it turns out, is majorly owned by Google. So I'm like, why is Google sending people out to collect Pokemon Go with OAuth level permissions on their phone? And the reason is because what was happening was as everyone was going out and hunting for Pokemon in the street, they were actually collecting real-time data of the world and sending that back to Project Tango, which is Google's real-time 3D real-world data set. 
So these systems are measuring how we feel, they're changing what we're doing, and we're not entirely aware of what's going on as we're participating with these systems. But the reason is because data is now, in some cases, called the new oil. It is the single most valuable commodity on the internet. The slides should be available. I've tried to include some links for you guys to look at and, and verify some of this. But it's certainly extremely valuable, and we're seeing companies like Google and like Facebook become very large, very powerful companies because of this. All right, another show of hands, please. All right, who has a Facebook account? Okay, keep that hand up. That's 75 bucks a month there, roughly. Who has, let's say, a Facebook account and a Google account? All right, that's about $150 in value on a mean scale. Some of us only, it's like a fraction of a penny per month. Others, it's thousands of dollars per month. But what's weird about this is that these are the two companies that now have the most powerful AI systems on the planet. These companies now that know how we feel, know how to affect the way we feel, and you know, I at least got my Gmail account, it was probably 2001 or two, and I was merrily typing away, and I'm like, hey, I get free tools, and I'm like thinking this is super, and then Facebook comes up, like, oh, I can connect with friends, and we're sharing. And now I'm like, wait a minute, this is something very off because Mark Zuckerberg is collecting all of our valuable data and all the value of that data he then monetizes, goes and buys multi-billion dollar homes and then gives us new data entry tools. I would rather that we all get paid for the valuable work that we're doing for Facebook and Google. So the artifice of AI also has other problems. And while at Botanic, our slogan is building humane machines, what we really try to do is to look at ways in which data curation methods can be open sourced. And there's a need for this because just in word to vec which is one of Google's primary natural language systems, we can see that there are weird ways in which culture and the kinds of things that we might not necessarily want to have in quality data percolates in. This is a slide that shows the word persuasive in word to vec and on the top is referring to persuasive men, and on the bottom is referring to persuasive women. And I think it's interesting to see this cultural sexism that comes through, because for the men, it's persuasive, astute, compelling. For the women, we have things like ditzy, compelling, manipulative, and kittenish. So this is actually sexist AI. Now if we go back to the healthcare bot where people think that the answer they're getting back from the AI system is objectively true, we need to recognize that under the hood this is not the case. The normalization of this data, as we were talking about earlier, that's really where a lot of the work lives. And oftentimes large companies like Google are just letting us do it and we don't do a very good job of curating data and actually building quality sets. Then we have this other problem because on Facebook, all of these bots that may be using natural language processing systems or maybe are just using prescripted are able to scam and spam and fish and troll faster and better and without getting exhausted like a human would. And so bots, by the way, all of us on Facebook are authenticated, but the bots on Facebook are not. We all have license plates and identities that are verified, but the bots don't presents problems. But there's ways to solve this, and over the years, some of the IP work that we've done and the builds have looked at both self-sovereign methods of authenticating bots and conversational interfaces, and we've also looked at trusted third-party services like OAuth and OpenID as well. But the bottom line is the bots need license plates. We need to be able to trust them. They need to be held accountable. Okay, so as I mentioned, Botanic was rolling along and we were kind of nurturing ourselves as some of the lower moments on cryptocurrencies. We benefited from Ethereum and other Monero, et cetera. And the distributed ledger, at some point around two, early 2017, but we were interested in it, we weren't really seeing it as relevant to our business. But then, this kind of a light went off. And we spun off an organization named Seed. 
uh, seed token is providing an open source economy for AI personalities, bots, chatbots, conversational assistants, and avatars. And the reason is because just like Linux, which is probably an, on some level, the kernel is in probably every single phone and computer in this room, we need to make sure that that thing is secure. There's this funny, before I go into this here, I'll, I'll let you read this, but I'll tell you a quick story about a semicolon. There was a semicolon that was in Linux kernel, and uh, somebody went in, an anonymous user, and they changed the semicolon to a colon. And one of the developers noticed it and said, that's kind of weird, because it opens up a security vulnerability. So they went back and they changed it back to the semicolon. And then two weeks later, Emo, sorry for re repeating the story, but two weeks later, then what happens is that that semicolon had been changed back into a colon, opening up that security vulnerability again. And so they went back and they said, wait a minute, let's set up a cron job so we can make sure that this isn't repeating. And it was because it was an open source effort and that people were collaborating that it facilitates the strength and the trust that we all have in Linux. So we need to do the same thing with bots. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I should have a cane. I'm, I turned 50 a couple of weeks ago, and in the years I've been watching this, I'm, I'm more concerned about the politics and socioeconomic implications of what's happening specifically in the Bay Area as what are essentially oligopolies like Facebook working in neo-feudal manners, just like back in France in the 1500s, where they would, the Lord would provide the land, the fiefs would work on it, sorry, the vassals would work on it, and then the vassals would take the fruits of their labor to the lords of the land. We're doing the same thing now with Facebook and with Google. We need to stop that. As bots and conversational interfaces are gonna be growing in the coming years and decades, we need to make sure that we have sustainable systems so that there are countries and populations and individuals that are being compensated for their value. So we figured out this system, this was like about a year to design and we got very, we had some excellent expertise, behavioral uh, economists from Imperial College um, working with our partners at Outlier, uh, Token Market, um, I'll mention other partners in a minute, but essentially the way that this thing is working right now, and if you go to Seed Token, we have a primitive chatbot that's showing that every time an API call is made, it's writing to the blockchain. We have a developer can come in and they can work and they can post a particular, you know, there might be a Git that they have and then there's a deployer and they want to integrate that Git, let's say that it's for taking your temperature and you need a thermometer API so that this healthcare doctor can use it. And they can take that particular component, build it into the bot, the deployer can then work with any company inside or outside of the seed network. That bot is then used and every time that data gets used by an end user, then somebody that provided the data gets compensated for it. So that's great. And bots, especially multimodal bots, such as we make at Botanic, are very hard to build. Let's be clear about this. Bots are not, you know, you can go to ChatFool and they'll say, oh, you can make a bot in like 10 minutes, but it's just not a quality system. Bots are like orchestras, especially multimodal bots that can work across channels. So we have these problems of how difficult it is to build bots and we want that to be open source and provably trusted. But then we also have things like GDPR and we need to recognize that the end user privacy should be an option. And so we've developed a system which we're implementing this month. We have the wallet working, we have the token working, we have the bot that's there. And as we continue to build this economy, we're also building an interface method so that a user, regardless of the channel that they would be speaking with the bot over, whether it's Signal or Telegram, Messenger, Skype, whatever, can say, oh, I want my data to be respected and private, and I'm willing to pay for that. Or they can move the slider over to the other side and say, I'm not worried about privacy, and I recognize it's valuable, and so pay me for my data. And that gives us a balanced model and it begins to generate a knowledge economy where all of us that are unique and any of us that have anything to say can provide data to the system and then make money for it. So let's say that there's like a kid in Mexico and he knows how to unbruise an avocado. 
what we're working towards in the coming years and do not yet have implemented, that that kid will be able to talk with a bot and say, oh, if you want to unbruise an avocado, you put it in lemon juice for 20 minutes. And that data, like in Wikipedia, can sit on the knowledge base. And at some point, the mother that's in Sophia is making avocado salad, and she goes and she says, oh, here's how I unbruise the avocado. And then that kid in Mexico can get paid for it. I'm happy to come back to the slide of those uh, questions as well. So the core of it, though, is that these systems need to have quality data. Oh, by the way, one more thing. This, in order for these users to know that their data is being respected, that their privacy is being respected, we need to do things like obscure the face or obscure the voice or change the amount of data that's going into the system. And so that open source framework allows a review and really an audit of the code to ensure that it's doing what it claims it can do. So blockchain, it looks like it's solving some of these problems of job displacement and of control of user data, provenance, ownership of that data, and long-term governance problems as well. And we thought we were crazy, and this is like two years ago we started this, but actually it's now beginning to be kind of a trend. And just last week in the New York Times, there was an article that talked about a number of us that are working together as partners. Ocean Protocol, Trent McConaughey is one of our advisors. We work closely with them. Fetch AI is a partner, Singularity Net, Botchain, and then also discussions with uh, similar groups taking approaches that are very similar with SNPs and AIGO. So the AI market is changing. And whether it's things like Fetch, which is basically a system that within a supply chain is looking at predicting what event is going to be happening and then builds a reputation based on the accuracy of its predictions, or whether it's Ocean Protocol, which is looking at very general methods of data curation, all of us are working together to try to push this away from Facebook and away from Amazon and away from Google as well. But this is too important of a moment, and AI is too big of a technology, too big of a cluster or a constellation. The wave of change is going to be immense, and we need to come up with solutions for this. Imagine if it was the web, early days of the web, and there were only maybe 10 companies that would allow you to make a website. That industry wouldn't flourish. And we all know that we're going to be talking to computers in the future. It's not that the graphical user interface or the command line interface is going to go away. But we will in the future be talking with these systems. And they will be measuring us. And as probably one of the world's largest retailers, Amazon is very interested in knowing how you feel about buying peanut butter. So bots present this powerful, especially multimodal bots and highly surveillance system. And if you happen to be a hospital or a helicopter parent or a dictator, then that's great. Surveillance is great. But we also need to recognize that those problems can now be solved with new open source models. And in order to do that, we have many years of work ahead of us. I hope that what we're building with Seed is something that outlives us. I hope that it's becoming something like Wikipedia. And we now have over 800 partners that have expressed interest, and we're growing it. 15,000 developers have joined. And we're continuing to roll things along as we go. Um, join us. We need help. We need, we need tons of help for a project this size. We've gotten some great traction so far. We need investment. We need partners. We need developers. We need deployers. Um, and as we look at the myriad different applications for conversational interfaces, we hope that you will join us. Um, so I think, Iskren, I'm coming up here. I hope that I have pegged this in exactly at the minute. Sped it up a bit. Should we ask questions or not? Yeah, okay, good. Sounds like we have a question. Good, good, good. I'd, I'd, love, I'd love a hard question. Questions? Please raise your hands. I asked you guys, there we are, good. I asked you guys three questions. I should get at least one back. <laughs> uh, hi. So great talk. I fully Thank talked you. to you with the bosses. Too. But I want to ask, you mentioned that uh, when training AI with uh, skewed data, for example, it can become biased. 
and then gives us uh, results that we don't want. And mm -hmm. an ethical question about that would be who decide what results we want the AI to give? You know? yeah. I think that will be a big problem in the future as well. So, thank you. Yeah, so if, if I can rephrase that, the, the skewed results we get back from non-curated systems or poorly curated systems can lead us to making bad decisions. And what you're saying is it would be better for us as end users to be able to represent our individual values to that system. Now we've looked at this a little bit because in these highly surveillance systems, we're able to actually pull various Bluetooth devices. And if, if uh, Android is running, we can collect a lot of data off of it. And the bot's actually able to learn better what that end user is doing based on the other devices that are in their house. And one of the things that I think is important is that as we get progressively, we're looking very much at small data. What is the user state data of that individual person? And how can we engage in a dialogue with them so that their values are represented? So this is exactly one of the concepts that we're following. We've implemented enough that we can collect all of the different data, the movement of the user, where they're at, when, what they're saying, how they feel, et cetera. However, we have not gotten to the stage at which we can have a dialogue with the end user just via natural language and they can say, here's how I would prefer to make decisions. Thank you for the suggestion, we'll keep on it. Yeah, I think we have time for one more question. Hello, thank you. Uh, this was a great talk and I really like the idea about uh, democratic uh, AIs. My question was basically because I was listening and I was thinking to myself, how is uh, like, how, is there a plan to win the war with Google and Facebook? Because I'm thinking that they're not really willing to let go of all these data they're, you know, creating uh, from us and you know for free and in all the intrusion in our lives that yeah. they're doing, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, um, look, if I were to consider anybody our competitor, it would probably be Amazon, just because I've got these gripes with Alexa. Um, Let's recognize that it's a big world, right? Uh, Tencent, Ali, Ali, Alibaba, and Baidu are essentially forking the internet right now. Uh, I believe that in less than a decade, as we see immense progress happening in China, China is rapidly outstripping the United States in terms of what they're doing because their systems aren't just working at the data level, but unlike Americans, they go all the way down into the hardware level. That provides them with much better data sets. And so, for me, yes, we have Facebook, we have Google in the West, we have Tencent, Baidu, and others in the East. Both of those giants will continue to lumber along and hoover up identities and make decisions for us, and as they are now in China, become an integral part of the government. And, at the same time, those of us that are working on this kind of an approach see it as an alternative. Uh, open source may, I think if it's refined enough, be widely adopted as we've seen in some cases with Linux. And I don't think about what we have so much really as a competitive advantage, but I think we have a collaborative advantage. And though I come from a capitalist country, over the decades I've changed my thinking and I guess I feel as though it makes more sense for us to work together as a group rather than to work against each other. It seems more productive. So. If we can hold hands and sing kumbaya, <laughs> if we can get enough collaboration moving in that same direction, then I think we can provide alternatives. And it doesn't, it's not gonna be a binary world. I recognize, you know, uh, prior to the web, it was all command lines, but command lines haven't gone away. And, you know, just like the graphical user interface isn't gonna go away with voice interfaces, these systems will combine. And so we're gonna also see that they're different verticals that are using many different solutions, and all we want to do is open up AI so that there is an alternative choice for people to make, whether it's within smart city governance or whether it's just within an IoT system at your home. So we see it as an alternative, okay? Yep, I think I'll wrap it up. I'd like to thank you all very much. Again, please, there's my email, marketbotanic.io, and those are the two URLs if you'd like to join us. Thank you. It's an honor to be here, and uh, let's go on to the next talk. All right, thank you.